Good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to um, the Air Center's uh, Networking Fridays event for today, 18th of September. Uh, my name is uh, Sami Djavitnia. Um, I, I work for a European Union agency in, uh, in Lisbon, Portugal. And um, more importantly, for the context of today's event, I'm also part of a initiative from the group on Earth observations uh, called Blue Planet. Today, I have the pleasure and uh, the honor of, uh, of um, moderating a session um, which is uh, very much close to my heart. Our speaker today will be um, Dr. Argero Cavada. Uh, for uh, the many people who know her um, by her um, name, Argy. So Argy serves as the manager of uh, NASA's uh, Earth Sciences Division, uh, work on sustainable development goals. Um, to extend uses of earth science and applications in support of the United Nations um, Sustainable Development Goals. She's also the Executive Secretary for the International Earth Observations for Sustainable Development Goals Initiative, the EO for SDG, and is the NASA representative to the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, uh, CEOS uh, um, SDG uh, Working Group. Just some background on, on RG. RG holds a PhD and a master's degree in atmospheric and ocean, and, on, and ocean science from the University of Maryland, um, as well as a master's degree in applied mathematics and statistics from Georgetown University and um, bachelor of science degree in physics from the John Hopkins University. Um, RG is from uh, lovely Chios in, in Greece. Uh, and the last bit of information, which I believe is very uh, relevant, and maybe we will touch upon it today, is that RG is a strong advocate for girls and women in, in STEM uh, in general, and, um, and hopefully maybe we have some time later on to be uh, touching upon these elements as well. So before I leave the floor to RG, just one piece of housekeeping information for everybody. Um, the presentation from RG will be approximately 20 to 30 minutes long, I believe. Uh, please, uh, for questions, uh, do not use the chat functionality in Zoom, but please use the Q&A functionality, which you see at the bottom of the screen. So I will be monitoring the Q&A, so please um, do put your questions in, uh, in that um, um, Q&A box down there. Thank you very much for your attention. And RG, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, Sami. And uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you, Sami, for the great introduction. And, and likewise, it's an honor to, um, to be sharing this uh, uh, presentation and the floor with you today. Uh, so I want to um, uh, as you know, I'm getting ready to start um, presenting these uh, slides that I've put together for today's talk. I want to, to highlight uh, um, the eo 4 SDG Initiative's uh, Twitter account that you can see over there. So I want to invite our colleagues and friends that are attending uh, to uh, visit and follow us on Twitter as well as on the eo 4 SDG website to find more information and to also find uh, information about how to get involved. Uh, uh, if you're interested in, in these activities that I will be presenting today. And so to get us started, I wanted to start by talking a little bit about the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And so five years ago, world leaders gathered from around the world to, to adapt this agenda as uh, a common framework for countries and uh, stakeholders to manage, monitor, track, uh, and drive progress on achieving sustainable development uh, in all its facets, social inclusion, economic growth, and environmental sustainability. And so there are 17 sustainable development goals and associated targets and indicators that uh, are have been put together to inform the way in which countries and the international community drive and also communicate on progress in um, towards sustainable development. And so data 
are at the heart of and the center of this agenda, which calls for new data acquisition and exploitation of a wide range of data sources, including Earth observations and geospatial information. And based on the most recent report that was released uh, in 2020, issued by the UN Secretary General, the report looked at progress achieved thus far before the COVID-19 pandemic and noted that progress remained uneven uh, and that we were not on track to meet the SDGs by 2030. And so the report also highlighted some significant gains um, that included, for instance, improvement in access to safely managed drinking water, as well as in areas that pertain to gender issues, such as increase in women's representation in leadership roles worldwide. However, the report also noted that, that um, there is still a number of people suffering from food insecurity, and actually that number has been on the rise, in addition to the alarming levels of continued natural environmental deterioration and persistent inequality across regions. And so with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, this health, but also economic and social crisis that we're all currently undergoing, uh, there is an increased a threat uh, toward the progress already achieved um, and also um, therefore the um, UN Secretary General has called uh, for using the SDGs as an organizing framework to help uh, uh, both uh, address uh, and um, deal with the current pandemic but also um, to um, support the recovery effort that countries are and will be putting forward uh, um, in, uh, in the future. And so in the next few uh, slides, I will be talking to you a bit about how Earth observations in particular, what is the role that they can and already are playing in helping monitor progress and, and, and track progress on um, um, achieving sustainable development, but also in helping inform management and decisions toward um, achieving that progress. And so to begin with, Earth observation data acquired remotely by space-borne sensors or airborne uh, instruments, in addition to in situ sensors and observations, represent valid and globally consistent sources of information for monitoring the state of our planet and increasing our understanding of Earth uh, processes. For instance, Earth observation data from satellites provide a unique ability to help um, monitor changes in global land cover and also measure the extent of land cover types and their changes over time. And there are many other applications and we will be visiting some of these applications today. So within the Group on Earth Observations and other intergovernmental and international efforts, we have been looking at how this data can help provide uh, and contribute as a direct input to the indicators, but also help support and augment statistical information that uh, um, uh, countries are using to report and track progress on, on achieving sustainable development, in addition to helping validate national statistical data inputs and communicating and visualizing trends and the geographic dimensions of the indicators. We also recognize that there are several challenges in, um, and limitations to the Earth observation data, as well as the human and technical capacity to process them. And so you can see some of those more commonly stated obstacles listed on the bottom left of this slide. And so a lot of um, advancements and strides have been made in uh, tackling some of these issues. For instance, in terms of restrictive data access policies, the US government mission data has been long freely available. And also um, the um, European satellites with the European Union's Copernicus program um, have a free and open data policy that enables and um, has opened up the prospects for access to Earth observation data required by developing countries in order to um, um, to help achieve sustainable development. But there is still a lot that needs to be done around um, more user-tailored methodologies and fit-for-purpose data sets. There is a need to do more in terms of helping um, uh, document, develop, and then share 
a solid track of uh, um, good practice examples and use cases that others can consider, learn from, and pursue. And so, to help, and so one, you know, to help advance the global knowledge about effective ways that Earth observations and geospatial information contribute to the SDGs. There is this uh, uh, group on Earth Observation co for sdg initiative that has been put together as one of the many efforts and initiatives that um, have contributed uh, to the advancement of the uses of Earth observations for informed decision making. And so this initiative in particular focuses on the SDGs and on both demonstrating the value of Earth observations and helping share that knowledge and enable the building of capacity and skills to um, to develop, um, uh, to, to use the data um, for monitoring and driving progress on the SDGs. And so you can see some uh, of the many contributing partners or uh, uh, collaborators in this initiative. And the initiative is co-chaired by um, uh, the US, and so NASA on behalf of the US, uh, JAXA on behalf of Japan, and INEHI, or the National Institute of Statistics and Geography, on behalf of Mexico. And this initiative works also across a number of other flagships and initiatives within uh, the Group on Earth Observations, uh, but also external stakeholders, including countries and, and organizations such as the national statistical offices and line ministries in countries, in order to bring scientific observations to the hands of these um, stakeholders and users who need them um, to, in order to monitor and um, um, track progress on biodiversity, agriculture, urban related SDG indicators, among other areas. And so, as mentioned earlier, we do have a, a website where you can find out more information about activities, upcoming events, and also if you go out there under get more information, there is also a list of country use cases that we have started um, uh, collecting, documenting, and sharing. And so you, I, I invite you to visit that and find out more about how countries are already applying Earth observations to um, monitor progress and drive progress toward the SDGs. So some of the other activities that we have had ongoing. Um, so last year we launched also a program um, to recognize excellence and innovation in uses of Earth observation data to address the SDGs. And you can see here highlighted one of the winners of last year's um, SDG, GeoSDG Award, uh, Uganda, who won this award for their work on applying Earth observations to predict a drought that would have hit the Karamoja region in Uganda, which uh, actually saved 2.6 million US dollars that could be used in relief after the drought. And so this was one of the six winners. And this year we've launched the second um, year of this award and we're currently in the process of finalizing selections and, and those will be announced at the upcoming November virtual uh, Geo Week. Um, and so there is a relevant link there where you can find information and on November 4th, you can uh, find out more about those selected projects and how these countries, organizations are applying Earth observations to um, address specific SDG targets and indicators. We have also been working quite a bit to document and share scientific knowledge and examples of how Earth observation experts are working with uh, countries and relevant stakeholders to integrate Earth observations in SDG indicator methodologies, country processes, and decision support systems. And so this special issue was published at the Remote Sensing Journal of the Environment in June, and it's comprised of 17 publications and an editorial with a large number of the papers focusing primarily on goal six of cl on clean water and sanitation, goal 15, uh, life on land, followed by goals 14 on life below water and 11 on sustainable cities and communities. Uh, in, and so uh, one of the items that we recognize where more work needs to be done is really in helping transition from data um, and information generated from the data to knowledge, which really focuses on understanding the patterns and then helping translate and connect this 
to policy targets and, and goals and decision making. And so we can perhaps speak more about this if there is time later today. A lot of the work that uh, um, uh, the Earth Observation community has been doing um, in enabling Earth Observation users with the SDGs has been focusing on integrating uh, Earth observation data, including global data sets, uh, among, um, um, among uh, integrating them into global methodologies and good practice guidance, but also working to then test these methodologies and uh, communicate emerging data products and tools for local as well as global monitoring to both um, country partners, but also to the relevant regional and global UN bodies. And so I have a few examples following that showcase some of these activities. And so I will start with talking to you briefly about this urban toolkit that uh, uh, we are currently in the process of developing. So the eu for sdg initiative is working with um, other initiatives within GEO, such as the Human Planet Initiative um, and, and partners in UN Habitat and a, a selected group of uh, regionally representative cities and countries to develop this uh, urban toolkit. And one of the key purposes is to really focus on identifying what are the local monitoring needs and how the Earth observation data can help address those needs. And so we're currently working on um, uh, putting together um, some overall guidance, but also sharing relevant data sets and tools in addition to innovative practices and use cases, good practice examples from countries and cities that are already applying the data to inform specific targets and indicators. And just to give you a couple of examples, here we're looking at changes in land use as population changes within urban settings, or looking at how Earth observation data can help inform and assess changes in, um, in slums and informal settlements in cities, but also um, looking at aspects of air quality in urban environments or access to open shared space. And so um, this uh, toolkit will be made available through the UN Habitat portal, and we are targeting a, a beta version launch for later uh, this year. The next uh, um, example that I wanted to share has been this uh, multi-stakeholder multi collaboration uh, focusing on goal six, and in particular looking at uh, um, freshwater-related ecosystems changes. And so UN Environment is the custodian agency for this particular indicator and has um, worked with uh, uh, GEO and several um, space agencies and, and um, research networks, in addition to Google and other stakeholders, to put together both a step-by-step -step methodology that is a, follows a progressive approach in that it enables and suggests the use of available global EU data products um, in conjunction with national, nationally derived data um, in order to provide and help assess changes in uh, the extent as well as other uh, parameters uh, that relate to freshwater related ecosystems such as quality or uh, changes in um, the extent uh, um, of uh, wetlands as well as mangroves. And so you see here a snap or a screenshot from a portal that has been put together um, that showcases uh, uh, changes in the extent of mangroves in Senegal. And so um, several of the global reference EU data sets uh, um, have been integrated into this portal and you can find out more information on this by going to the stg661.app web portal. Another example that I wanted to highlight that again is a, a good example also of multi-stakeholder collaboration and partnership is uh, between the Geo Blue Planet initiative with UN Environment uh, to, um, to develop a methodology for assessing coastal eutrophication. And so Geo Blue Planet is also working with ESRI to both produce statistics for the global indicators, uh, notably chlorophyll A deviations and anomalies, but also to develop a dashboard that can serve as a decision support tool to help identify eutrophication hotspots. 
In addition, another effort focuses on assessing and monitoring marine litter. And so here, UN Environment is working with you with Geo Blue Planet as well as IBM. And as one of the first steps for this effort, they're also working with the Wilson Center to visualize and analyze marine litter data from community-based cleanup efforts. So this is a nice example of where crowdsourced information is also being utilized in order to inform and monitor marine litter and inform this specific SDG indicator. The next initiative I wanted to briefly highlight is the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network. And so this is, an, this is within um, a, the GEO Biodiversity Observation Network um, uh, initiative within GEO. And uh, this activity focuses primarily on helping uh, develop and routinely generate information about the quality and extent of different oceanographic habitats or features based on satellite and model data. And so in particular, um, uh, here um, I'm showing you seascapes uh, that is a collaboration between MBON, um, uh, NOAA, NESDIS, as well as the U.S. Integrated Ocean Observation System. And so, as, as I already mentioned, the focus here is providing information about the quality and the extent of different oceanographic habitats or features. Um, and so, this can be used to assess and predict uh, um, for instance, different planktonic and fisheries communities that reside within the seascapes. And so there is currently an effort to develop a tool that combines information from, um, um, uh, from this system with uh, in situ data from the Ocean Biodiversity Information System to help determine relevant indicators such as the endangered uh, species relative to all species in a specific uh, exclusive economic zone. And so this effort and, and, um, um, is one of uh, the activities within uh, MBON and um, GEOBON more broadly that relates to several of the goal 14 uh, um, uh, targets um, around sustaining and um, sustainably managing and conserving marine um, and coastal ecosystems, and also supports the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. So for the last couple of slides that I have here, I wanted to also share some um, information on a couple of projects that are working at the global and uh, the, the second project that I will share works at the country level uh, to enable the broader use and help build capacity in utilizing Earth observations for specific SDG indicators. And so this is a, a project led by Eric Sanderson of Wildlife Conservation Society. And uh, this project focuses on developing a new real-time integrated mapping and reporting system that produces regional results about sites important to biodiversity. And so this is specific uh, to goal 15 life on land and indicator 15.1.2. And so here by near real time, we mean repeating analysis as often uh, as, uh, as often, uh, repeating analysis as often as the underlying satellite or field data change. And so this project focuses in particular on tigers and um, is um, and, and one of the objectives, as mentioned, is to implement this system utilizing a cloud-based geospatial computing platform and helping serve then the data through a web portal to different um, agencies and range state governments that are responsible uh, for reporting under this uh, um, SDG, but also on the Convention on Biological Diversity. One of the challenges that is recognized through this project is um, acquiring data from uh, countries and relevant organizations. And so organizations many times fear sharing the tiger location data due to unscrupulous use, for instance, poaching. And therefore, currently the project is using simulated data. And so this is a continuous effort to help build trust and work hand in hand with end users and stakeholders to both develop the trust, but to also enable the sharing of information so that um, uh, Earth observation data can be in fact put to use to support uh, um, uh, this effort. And so the last um, 
project highlight that I wanted to share with you is another activity, um, again, taking us more on goal 14. And so this specific project uh, focuses on Belize, and in particular Belize's uh, Barrier Reef Lagoon um, and the Belize River watershed. And um, it explores how Earth observation data, including um, optical data sets, as well as in situ measurements of coral reef extent and water quality and nutrient load parameters, can help uh, um, Belize in assessing changes in water quality and better managing their um, um, marine uh, systems. And so one of the partnering organizations here is the Coastal Zone Management Authority and Institute in Belize, who is responsible for monitoring coastal and marine water quality. And so the team uh, has been working hand in hand with uh, the Belizean government um, in order to um, uh, develop this effort and to also help strengthen the overall capacity of key institutions in Belize in using Earth observations for marine and terrestrial ecosystem monitoring. One of the areas that um, um, they have noted as a, an area of a challenge, it has been around the need for more institutional coordination and adequate coordination among the entities that are responsible for monitoring and data collection and then for reporting at the national level on the SDGs and also reporting up to the United Nations. And so um, these, uh, are these are some um, indicative examples of the plethora of activities that are taking place. Um, and I, with that, I would like to thank you all very much for listening in uh, and I'd be happy to take questions and have a discussion. So thank you very much. Arjit, thank you very much. Um, very interesting um, this presentation. Um, so we have some questions, RG, coming in. Uh, we have some uh, that are also being channeled through through WhatsApp. So I will be uh, going through these these different platforms. For the, so the first question we have on the Q and A, RG, um, is is the following. Um, the, the sustainable development goals, the, uh, the, uh, the targets and indicators uh, assume that there is a global consensus that these are uh, loadable goals. Um, however, geopolitics in many cases uh, is trying to, to sort them in, in one way or the other. What, the question is, what can we as scientists and researchers do to promote the use of factual information in the face of pushback, often from national leaders, scientific evidence. Great, thank you very much, Sami, and thank you um, to the person that asked this question. So first of all, indeed, this is something that uh, um, we have seen uh, as well. And um, I will note that despite the fact that the SDGs as a global framework was agreed by um, or UN member states uh, in 2015, it is indeed uh, challenged and in, in certain cases there are questions around uh, um, applicability and relevance for a specific region or country. And so to begin with, I will note that there are efforts, especially at the regional level through um, economic UN economic commissions and relevant networks to, to help connect uh, um, the global to country um, level um, efforts and in some cases uh, and fill some gaps or in some cases when necessary such regional fora have even developed regional um, frameworks of uh, targets and indicators to complement uh, the SDGs at the global level. Uh, what we can do as, um, as researchers and scientists, uh, I would suggest that um, we should work uh, more closely with uh, in-country partners, such as uh, especially also non-traditional partners, uh, including statistical offices, to help build that uh, knowledge and capacity that is needed uh, to enable a more operational use of the data, but also demonstrate the impact in addition, I think it is important to help, uh, um, as mentioned earlier, um, and 
focus a little bit more on showing how the knowledge derived from the data and information. So starting from the data and um, um, generate and the information generated from the data in the form of physical parameters, then going into the knowledge that can be put into indicators that then countries um, can use as a way uh, to assess and evaluate their progress toward fulfilling a specific target. And so it is important to put that knowledge within context. And, and, and that's where I think there is a gap and more needs to happen in order to demonstrate and help people understand how they can be using the data um, in practice. The last thing I will note is that um, there is a, a, it is important to utilize real world examples and so to the extent feasible showcasing how um, a specific um, advancement in science, a product, a method, a tool has been used and applied and what has been the impact within a real setting it's, and, you know, even better having some testimonial uh, from an, a stakeholder and end user uh, speaks volumes. And so I think this is, you know, another area where we can really work more uh, to, to develop such real uh, world examples. Thank you, Argy. We, we have a question from um, uh, Julio Herrera Estrada. Um, on what recommendations do you have for young professionals who want to build a career in Earth observations for sustainable development? So from your perspective, what are the skills that they should work on and where should they look for opportunities? Uh, yes, thank you to Julio Herrera. Great question. Um, and so I would say that, you know, first of all, it is important to, to follow your, your passions. And so if, if uh, sustainable development and earth observations is something that you find that you have a passion for, um, I, I think that uh, getting involved from early on in uh, relevant societies um, especially in some interdisciplinary research from uh, whether it is, you know, even early in your academic uh, career or even high school, by uh, getting involved in the project that examines the intersection of uh, sustainable development itself and how it intersects with science um, is key. In terms of the, um, the skills that are necessary, I would say that um, there is a, a breadth of, um, of uh, uh, backgrounds and, and people from diverse backgrounds that are involved in this uh, um, in this field, and so certainly um, having a background in, in earth science and research uh, uh, provides you with skills that are necessary to understand how um, um, the data uh, can be applied, analyzed, what can be some of the main. Um, obstacles and challenges in, and limitations to the data. And so that is very important. Uh, that combined with, uh, uh, re with uh, interpersonal skills, with building those interpersonal skills, building relationships, getting connecting and learning from others and exposing yourself to, to um, a diverse uh, um, uh, to, to groups uh, that uh, have uh, uh, diverse uh, uh, backgrounds and knowledge, not just uh, educational and academic knowledge, but also uh, that bring in those other differences, cultural differences. And so being able to, to have uh, those experiences and then um, develop some uh, diplomatic skills as well. I would say that diplomacy is important in science. Diplomacy is key. The, the last thing, which is something that, for instance, I am continuously learning and I had to learn more while working on the Earth Observations and Sustainable Development Goals, has been uh, connecting with uh, people from uh, diverse backgrounds or different sectors who may not necessarily um, share or, you know, may not, sometimes may not mean the same thing to them that they mean to a person that is, uh, has an earth science background. So talking about uncertainty, speaking with uh, statisticians uh, or um, working with uh, um, national governments uh, and decision makers. So being able to 
being interested in learning from people and interacting with people, I think, is key. And then being able to have a combination of this uh, um, earth science and uh, background or observation skills, but also um, combining that uh, with uh, um, uh, science communication and uh, science diplomacy. I would say that these are some of the uh, factors that contribute to um, um, or some of the the areas that if somebody is interested in, in getting involved uh, in this field, uh, they can explore further. Of course, there are others, but those are just some that come to mind. Thank you, RG. And if I may add to that question, based on your involvement and advocacy uh, for the girls and women in STEM, how would you um, extend that to actually trying to uh, maximize uh, the opportunities of, uh, of, uh, of girls and women in this very subject from a personal perspective and, uh, and in a wider con context Absolutely. as well? Absolutely. So I think that, um, you know, there are certainly, as I mentioned, advocacy groups and, and, and groups like uh, Ladies of Landsat that exist on Twitter and, and other groups that help champion and share knowledge about um, women um, in um, women at all different levels in their states that are involved in STEM fields. I think that in itself, and so getting involved, getting actively involved, but also participating in mentorship programs, I think uh, um, is you know one way to facilitate and to to further support uh, girls and women in STEM. Uh, there are opportunities um, to uh, there are there are many opportunities to contribute and and so everybody interested can contribute you know in in, in different ways and so I would say that from mentorship programs um, advocacy groups as I mentioned but also scientific societies like the American Geophysical Union the AMS um, there are opportunities to get involved and and, and further. Um, uh, especially support such issues. I would say that uh, um, also it's very important to find a champion uh, that uh, can support you throughout uh, your um, academic and professional career and uh, to have good models to follow uh, and to, to just continue um, producing good science, doing good work and learning from others. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, Sam, if you were looking for something else. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you, RG. Um, I, I have a number of questions coming in, RG, on specifically how um, um, states uh, can get involved uh, with the EO SDG initiative. But before I go into that, uh, I wanted to ask you um, a question um, related to the complexity of uh, uh, the UN system and of the SDG architecture, um, mm -hmm. because you know it's not always clear uh, who is responsible for reporting at national level, um, who the custo custodian agencies are. Uh, you did mention the national statistics uh, Uh, I lost your audio a bit, Sami. <clears throat> I cannot hear you. Yes, but it sounds very, very far away. Uh, and I see others cannot hear as well. Uh, I can hear you a little bit. Um, I, I think you were speaking about the complexity of the... Can you hear me now? A little bit better, yes. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I was speaking about the complexity of, um, uh, of the UN structure, uh, specifically related to the SDG uh, reporting, and that there are many partners and actors involved. Yes. Uh, 
mention goes to the national statistics office, the patent office, the Canadian agencies, uh, and there's other entities at the uh, local uh, uh, and national level. So, from an EOSG perspective, uh, um, how do you um, envisage, or what are um, the suggestions you give to a member state or an organization within a member state uh, to get involved? Yes, so I would say that I think, you know, I heard most of what you said, Simon. So indeed, uh, the, the, the UN system is complex and part of the role of your for SDGs really has been to, to help learn about um, the processes that are in place for review and monitoring and, and to help also share that knowledge within uh, GEO and uh, collaborating organizations to really help enable and connect uh, ongoing activities and applications to the SDGs. And so certainly the statistical, the national statistical systems do play a key role, um, given that um, they are responsible for collecting data and producing a comprehensive set of integrated statistics, which can then be utilized for international aggregates. And so it is important for um, um, it is important to consider them as a, a, a big part of this. Um, in addition, uh, it is clear that the 2030 Agenda recognizes the importance of country-led um, evaluations in data. And so um, in working with uh, international agencies, so on the international front, the international agencies are responsible for um, those, those so-called custodian agencies are responsible for compiling um, comparable international data series and helping to um, work with countries. So first of all, helping develop these global methods and metadata that can be used uh, by countries to inform how they can be producing these uh, indicators, but then also um, helping then um, uh, work with countries to get data and provide these regional and global uh, aggregates uh, uh, to the UN. And so that relationship and, and collaboration is important. In, in certain cases, UN agencies have uh, um, um, country POCs that they work with. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, that part of knowledge is key, and, and I know that uh, it comes back many times to us, both from the um, Earth observation community and on the countryside, sometimes in terms of uh, the need for stronger institutional arrangements and awareness about who are the relevant points of contact, uh, both in country for a specific um, SDG monitoring and uh, goal monitoring and reporting but also at the un level then um uh, the respective custodian agencies responsible for that and so we've been doing some of this uh, active some of this work um, in working on specific stg areas and trying to um uh, to to grow that knowledge and also to share it uh, outward. Um, I'm not quite sure I heard the very last part of your question, Sami. Um, Can you hear you... me now? M much better, much better. Okay. okay, no, I think you answered the, the, the question. Okay. Um, uh, I think the question, I asked that question because uh, through uh, the WhatsApp channel, um, I have a number of questions uh, coming in uh, from uh, the island of um, Sao Tome, uh, and, um, and Principe um, that uh, are asking uh, how they can get involved uh, with the EO4 SDG project. Um, we, we also have Nigeria who would be interested in, uh, in, in knowing uh, additional information. Uh, uh, A, to see if there are already entities in Nigeria who are working with you, or if they're not, then how they can um, participate. And there's a question from Cabo Verde on uh, how can SIDS uh, engage uh, with the EO4 SDG initiative? That's, that's wonderful to hear. And I want to thank the colleagues uh, from uh, all these uh, wonderful places that are interested. So we, we'd love to, to have you get involved. And I would say that as a first point, you know, you can go to the website 
uh, send us a direct uh, email and we'd love to get you involved in the community. Uh, I would also note that, um, and so normally the way that um, the EU for SDG um, uh, convenes is through teleconferences and also meetings, but also we're focusing on specific project activities. And in doing that, in particular, we work with other thematic initiatives within GEO that may have uh, a particular focus and expertise on one area. So I would encourage the colleagues to, to link with us. You can link with me directly or go through the EO4STG website and, and send us an email uh, through there. There is also the Twitter account that I mentioned, so you can follow us there to get more information and also uh, send us a direct message there. Um, in addition, we would be happy to also link you with other geo activities, as I mentioned, depending on the specific area of focus. For instance, if you if there is a specific need or interest on biodiversity or um, on a different um, on use of earth observations for um, um, agricultural purposes, then there are respective um, initiatives that uh, um, would be uh, appropriate to work with and so would love to also put you in touch with them. Uh, but um, noting that, um, I would say that uh, um, there is uh, it's an open, you know, I mean, certainly this is an open community and so we invite people to join. Um, I did see there was, a, I, I see a question about specific global initiatives looking at early warning indicators. And so for biodiversity, but also for other um, areas, I wanted to speak to that briefly and, and highlight um, GeoGlam as an open community uh, that is uh, um, built around common interest in agricultural monitoring. And so, um, in addition, of course, I highlighted earlier MBON as part of GeoBON, the global, the geo biodiversity observation network that um, is focusing on um, facilitating um, the or enhancing national biodiversity observation systems. And so these are just a couple of initiatives that come to mind that are working uh, toward uh, uh, producing or updating operational products. Um, <clears throat> for instance, uh, global change detection maps or forest cover or looking at uh, marine environmental um, databases and developing a compendium of those. Um, and so certainly there, there are those activities that are ongoing and very well established. Thank you, Argy. There's our colleague Frank Muller Carger, who is involved uh, in both um, MBON and um, and Blue Planet, uh, wanted to to know from you how you see the geo members and groups involved in the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Uh, um, be involved uh, with your initiative and if you have any suggestions for mechanisms uh, to fund uh, such an involvement between these uh, initiatives. Uh, so, um, so I think that um, in terms of, so as I mentioned, this is an open community. It's an initiative that is built around a, a common interest and intent in enabling further uses of Earth observations for the SDGs. And so the, the resource, resource commitment of participants is based on best efforts. And so all who share a common interest for Earth observations for sustainable development goals are welcome uh, to join. There is no formal membership process. Uh, and so the best way to get involved is to, to reach out to the EU for SDG. You can reach out to myself um, or uh, you can send us an email, as I mentioned, to get involved in, in a specific in our community, but then also in a specific working um, activity um, or initiative. Uh, GEO, uh, within GEO, there have been more efforts lately around engaging and sharing knowledge about funding mechanisms. And so uh, there is certainly a community where more information can be uh, found. Um, but I think that's, you know, uh, that's what I would share about this. And, Thank you, RG. We have a comment in the chat uh, regarding um, uh, the women in STEM. Um, we have Suleiman Sadiku, 
who is sharing a piece of information that I believe is um, is uh, of interest to 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 everybody. Um, and uh, uh, the Federal University of Technology in Mina is sending a proposal to the Association of Commonwealth Universities on a gender grant, on a, uh, on a grant, on an annual call on, on gender. Uh, and uh, all researchers in, in um, member countries, I believe, from the Commonwealth uh, uh, can apply. So this is, uh, information is, is available yeah. um, to, to, to everybody. Um, uh, there is also uh, always from, from the chat, uh, uh, a question from um, uh, Cape Verde uh, that makes reference to um, to training school, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I'm not sure if if I am interpreting this question uh, correctly. But uh, the question from Cape Verde is uh, is uh, is a training school opportunity open to everybody, and how you get access? Okay, and, and I'm not, can I, so this is on the chat window, but I'm not quite sure. Is this from uh, uh, Suleiman? Uh, no, Suleiman was, mm -hmm. um, was, was before on the, on the annual call and... Uh, oh, yes, 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 of course, yes, yes, yes. Um, I'm not quite sure about the training school that uh, our colleague from uh, Cape Verde, um, I think what, what I spoke about is that there are certainly um, capacity development efforts, including both webinars and in-person trainings that uh, um, are uh, taking place. And so, for instance, uh, NASA has an Applied Sciences Remote uh, Sensing Training Program, and a lot of the material and trainings are all material and trainings are available on the NASA website. And so I would invite you to, to visit that. In addition, there are a lot of training opportunities that are taking place uh, through the GEO initiatives. Um, so certainly resources that are available openly um, out there. Um, I'm not quite sure to which training school in particular uh, our colleague is referring to. Okay. And, and Yes, and so going back to a little bit more, so I think we've talked a bit about um, women in STEM, we talked about the importance of uh, female STEM pioneers and also experts in the field and mentorship, but I think there are certainly also programs around uh, and scholarships supporting women in STEM, so these are um, resources and opportunities that uh, young women interested in getting into a STEM field can be, can be pursuing. Uh, I'll just add that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, RG. We have then um, a couple of questions related to your um, uh, partnership uh, with uh, with Blue Planet, uh, and uh, there's um, um, somebody who's asking how uh, you can access and contribute to the uh, uh, eutrophication coastal eutrophication application. Uh, and where to gather additional information on the marine litter project uh, you mentioned. So I think that um, I would I would you know certainly point out um, our Blue Planet colleagues and I mean some of you are one of them and uh, you are involved in these efforts. Um, I I would suggest that um, I can include in the chat the Geo Blue Planet website. And so you can connect uh, with uh, Emily Smale and colleagues from uh, Blue Planet that uh, uh, could help uh, get you involved in um, those ongoing activities. So it's geoblueplanet.org. Mm -hmm. And I'll add that to the chat window. Yeah, and, and also Emily's uh, contact will be, will, will be sure. helpful uh, as well. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a question coming from the Caribbean area, uh, RG. They are asking if uh, there's other projects uh, in the Caribbean where EOS for the uh, EO for SDG is involved, uh, in addition to the one you mentioned in in Belize. Um, the, I mean, uh, yes, and so. Um, the, so there is a, so the one that I mentioned in Belize serves as a demonstration for you for SDG and is a NASA funded project and, and there is a partnership between NASA and SICA, the Central American Integration System that was uh, recently developed 
and show specific activities that have stemmed from uh, that partnership are currently ongoing. I would need to get back to our colleague uh, with respect to a specific list of other uh, activities. Uh, but there is certainly enhanced collaboration, especially through this uh, uh, partnership with SICA. Uh, on uh, the question of uh, uh, getting involved with the initiative, um, there is a question from Fatima Khan uh, that is asking if uh, individuals as well uh, can get involved. So is, it, is the partnership open only uh, to uh, research organizations or national administrations or also to individuals? Uh, it's certainly open uh, to individuals, again, within uh, um, the, what I mentioned, I mean, we are, frame, I mean, I would say that um, we definitely welcome uh, participants to join. Again, this is, um, the research commitment is based on best efforts, that, as I mentioned, but um, if you share the interests of you for STG, uh, you're welcome to join the community. And if you wish to contribute, we would love to, to have you involved. And I did include the chat in the chat window the contact us information for you for STG, where you can send us a direct email or find the other forms of communication. Something related to this, RG, you, you mentioned um, crowdsourcing data, uh, citizen science. Uh, um, in your opinion, what is the role that uh, crowdsources data and citizen science uh, has in support to um, EO for SDG as an initiative, but in a wider uh, scope uh, uh, for uh, uh, monitoring and reporting of, uh, of the targets and indicators? Uh, that's, that's it. Thank you for that question. Um, so certainly, um, there is an increasing role that we see in citizen science. And um, there is already, there are at least uh, five SDG indicators where citizen science is contributing. I would invite colleagues to, to look at for a recent publication by Dilek Freisel from IASA on, um, on uh, citizen science data um, and SDGs. And so, you know, just to bring a couple of examples, for instance, um, uh, I will bring up OpenStreetMap as an online crowdsourced community-driven project that focuses on producing an open and free map of the world. And, and so, um, in a sense, I think this is already a, a, a great example of how crowdsourced information can be used and serve um, or facilitate uh, purposes that relate to disaster response and humanitarian aid, including the SDGs. And, um, if we look at the SDGs in particular on goal nine and in particular an indicator that focuses on um, the proportion of rural population that lives uh, within a certain distance from um, all season roads, open street map data are included as a complementary or alternative source of data for countries that perhaps do not have sufficient information on road location um, uh, data or perhaps in some cases this information is missing completely. So we can see the value of crowdsourcing in uh, such cases. And I mentioned also earlier the, um, the effort for monitoring marine plastic, which also involves a crowdsourcing component for measuring marine plastics on beaches and shorelines. Uh, Arj, it's three o'clock. Can I steal another five minutes of your time? Is that okay with you? That's fine, please go ahead. Okay, so you, you uh, mentioned the, uh, the special issue of the remote sensing of uh, environment uh, um, on, on EO4SDG. Uh, yes. And I believe in there, uh, there is uh, um, uh, a, a, a call uh, for the need of transitioning towards uh, um, a new framework uh, focused on the element of knowledge. Um, so uh, there is the data information knowledge uh, wisdom paradigm. And uh, I believe the, the, the overriding message is we have to focus on, on knowledge. And this is something that also comes up uh, in, um, in, in, in Geo's message of how 
uh, information is presented and what is the purpose. Can you elaborate from your perspective and the perspective of the initiative what this means? Yes, so I think this really reinforces the message that, you know, as a, a nerve observation community, we need to, to focus on, um, on, to focus more on what's happening, you know, in, again, like the real world and how we can put information derived from data into context at the country level. And so um, what, what we mean by that is that it is important to, in order to, uh, for scientific developments to work in an operational way, we need to work more closely with countries and policymakers to help both um, enable further understanding and, and the how to use that information to really then produce uh, metrics that can inform not just the indicators, but can really help uh, assess the targets and the goals. Meaning, um, you know, what, how can the data really be applied to better manage, um, a, for a country to better manage its um, uh, coastal ecosystems to, uh, to take measurements to address specific water quality issues. So putting things into context and really helping uh, derive knowledge from the data and, and, and information generated um, is is where there is still a gap that we you know noted particularly in the issue and and by looking through um, uh, the collected knowledge I'm using knowledge again but the collected information provided through through the publications there um, so. I, I think that that's, you know, that's primarily it. So how can we produce and, and how can these indicators or indices really represent the knowledge that is necessary to policymakers to drive wiser decisions and how the Earth Observation community can focus more on that uh, aspect of uh, um, uh, the workflow or the, the process. I have one last uh, question and then I will leave the floor to you, RG, to, to, to maybe, uh, if, if you want, uh, um, provide some, uh, some last comments. And do you think that uh, the Earth observation community is selling uh, itself short when uh, only discussing about the tracking of the progress of the SDG? So the question is, uh, the disaggregation, so on a spatial and uh, um, uh, perspective, but not only, is, is uh, extremely important in the SDG framework. And uh, Earth observation is uniquely positioned to provide this. Um, so is it that we have to go beyond uh, the, the, the concept of just using EO to monitor? but to actually address the SDG targets by identifying hotspots or providing forecasts. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Absolutely. I think that uh, that's, that's a valid question. And I don't think that by looking at the monitoring and tracking aspects, we suggest that this uh, is not uh, that we should not also be looking at how earth observations are driving. And in fact, uh, as mentioned, Earth observations are already supporting, and Earth observation applications are already supporting a variety of um, efforts um, um, in driving progress towards sustainable development. And so I would say that um, I, I do not believe, and some of the examples that I've highlighted do not actually solely look at monitoring and tracking, but also through that at informing um, um, implementation and also driving progress toward the SDGs. Uh, so absolutely agree. And I think that we need to work on all these fronts. Thank you very much, RG. Um, to the, um, the rest of the audiences that have kindly put in uh, questions and we don't have time to answer them now, RG, can I ask you if uh, the organization can send them to you uh, via email and, uh, and you reply to them uh, offline? Is that, is that okay? Yes, I think that would be fantastic, Sami. I'd love to have that opportunity. And, you know, just in, in thinking about the last question, I will note that there are ongoing efforts to integrate um, 
uh, information, they, they, to integrate Earth observation data with socioeconomic data and to help generate uh, storylines or story maps, looking at status and trends. And also, ultimately, the goal is to generate policy messages. And so, uh, certainly by looking at how Earth observations can help countries monitor the SDGs, we're also looking at this as a way to um, to help bring further awareness about all the derived benefits from applying Earth observations toward also driving progress. Um, so yes, so I'll, I'll stop there and absolutely I'd love to answer other questions offline. Thank you, RG. Um, well, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, RG, talking with you. Um, sorry to have uh, uh, gone over the, the, the hour that we, we were given. Uh, in fact, there's more comments and questions coming in. But I, I, I leave the floor to you, RG, if you have any concluding uh, remarks you would share uh, with everybody. And once again, from, from, from me, thank you very much for this enlightening uh, uh, hour uh, and a little bit more of, of your talk. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Sami, to you and the meeting organizers. I, I want to thank uh, colleagues. I, my eye did catch uh, Frank miller Carger, who, you know, contributed a couple of slides on M1 here. So I want to thank him very much. I want to thank Emily Smail and other colleagues uh, from the eu for sdg initiative, uh, including uh, um, our colleagues at ESA, the European Space Agency, Mark Paganini. I want to thank Lawrence Friedel from NASA. Um, uh, Paloma Merovio from Mexico, as well as Chuishida from JAXA and, and many of the other contributors to this effort. Um, there is certainly a lot more that wasn't covered in today's presentation. Um, efforts that are happening at country level, um, like, uh, um, um, for instance, um, in um, I mean, I just want to note that, you know, this was just a small presentation of the activities that are uh, going on, and there are certainly a lot of remaining challenges, and therefore I want to invite colleagues uh, in uh, participating today to, to reach out and, and, and join our initiative at eu 4 sdg um, or um, one of uh, uh, the other geo initiatives that are focusing on a specific thematic area that relates to a specific goal um, but in the end, I think that we all are aiming to uh, better utilize data derived from Earth observations to drive informed decisions, to uh, move toward uh, better, more sustained, more resilient societies, and to definitely utilize this, inf this information to also build back better from the current pandemic. So I want to, uh, to thank you all very much. And again, uh, I'll be happy to answer the questions offline uh, later on. Thank you, Sami. Thank you very much. One last message to, to everybody. Um, RG's presentation will be available on the Air Center's uh, website soon, uh, as well as the um, registration uh, of, uh, of, of the event uh, that we had uh, today. So once again, thank you, RG. A real pleasure uh, talking to you. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to, to everybody. Okay, bye -bye. thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.